All right, welcome to part two. Uh, in the first part of this demonstration, we launched MS Fragger uh, via the Frag Pipe interface, and all we wanted to do was to run our search in MS Fragger. We didn't want to run any of the downstream tools, but now we're going to go back and do this without ID Picker. ID Picker is, is beautiful software, but it's also software you've got to install, and if you're running on a Mac, you may not be able to run it, and there are all kinds of reasons why you, it might not be satisfactory. In this case, we are able to do an awful lot of our operations all within one interface. And at this point, our, our database search um, tutorial looks a lot more like the report, the this uh, like this tutorial that was created by Sarah. So um, that's that's good news. Let us now uh, return to our FragPipe interface. As you remember, on this very first page, FragPipe has uh, found where to find the MS Fragger uh, jar file where to find the Philosopher EXE that's uh, designed for this platform, and of course it checks for Python. But again, Python's not going to enter into it for now. Um, we uh, need to select the raw files that we're going to include, um, and again we can simply say add files, and specify that we want these 10 raw files all to be searched. Now it's particularly important in this case that we specify the names of, of uh, these files. So again, we're going to call this one red1 one and red2. There are ways to have the software automatically pick up labels for you. Um, we're, we're not making use of them here, but in this case, we only have the, uh, sorry, we only have these 10 files to name, so this is not the, the worst case scenario. Yellow1, yellow2. Did I start yellow in the right place? One, two, three, four, five. Good, yes. All right, yellow three, yellow four, and yellow five. Everyone had 10 files there to name, I think. Okay, in this case, um, we want to use the database that we downloaded earlier. Um, uh, this is, again, the, uh, the reference proteome for uh, E. coli, including reviewed and unreviewed sequences. Um, the target uh, decoy sequences, uh, the, the decoys are, are denoted by the rev underscore uh, tag. Sometimes somebody else is providing you a sequence database and they may not always tell you how do they label the decoys. This auto detect mode is a really handy way to figure that out um, retro retroactively. So given a, a FASTA sequence database, the software can tell you which labels are likely used to demark, uh, to denote the decoys from the targets, so it's handy to be able to use that feature. In this case, we want the decoys to be exactly half the database, so seeing that rev underscore is found in exactly 50% of the entries is good news. Okay, um, we come again to MS Fragger. Once again, we're going to specify that we want to start with the defaults for closed search. And yes, we definitely want to set all the downstream tools to use appropriate defaults for a, um, for a closed search. Um, again, we're not going to mess with how much RAM or how many threads are assigned. If you set both of these values to zero, it will default to using all of your memory and all of your CPU cores. And that, of course, usually leads to a faster result, or it runs you into an out-of-memory error, sorry. <coughs> okay, um, once again, we must remember that in this case, the tandem mass spectra were collected in a low-resolution trap so we need to specify that it has a 0.5 absolute or M over Z deviation allowable for fragments. And we're going to continue on with the precursor mass tolerance of anywhere from minus 50 to 50 ppm. I'm going to turn off calibrate uh, masses again because I think that that is, uh, uh, in this case, not necessary and I want the demo to run relatively quickly. We're not going to change to semi-triptych search. We're not gonna change the modifications or the mass changes, we're still going to have plus 57 on cysteine. Um, we don't need to alter any of the advanced options. But I would point out that the same interface is here to enable you to do open search. So if you want to go that direction, you can, but I would strongly suggest you do it on a desktop computer with a lot of RAM because it'll go faster. Um, all right, next we go to the downstream options. Now before, we had shut off peptide profit and protein profit. But in this case, they've been rechecked because you remember we told it that we want to configure downstream tools to reflect that we're doing a closed search as well. Protein, uh, protein profit and peptide profit are part of that. 
I would note that it has some, some features here about PPM and accurate mass. These reflect that the, uh, the software is going to evaluate the, um, uh, the, the mass accuracy that can be achieved by this mass, uh, mass analyzer, that we've, we've given it a fairly wide tolerance of 50 PPM for the precursors, and it's going to use that as a way to decide which modification, uh, sorry, which uh, PSMs are correctly identified and which are not. We also have things like non-parametric, which means that the software is able to, um, to have fewer assumptions in figuring out where this boundary between uh, well-identified and falsely identified PTMs are, uh, PSMs uh, are found. Um, we're going to continue on to report, and yes, we definitely do want it to do a report in this case. You should definitely check multi-experiment report, because in this case we have the 10, experiment, uh, the ten different <coughs> experiments and we need to treat each of them separately, but conjointly at the same time. Um, we do want to print decoys because we, um, frankly, leaving those decoys in there is useful to us in getting a sense of how many spectra a known falsely identified protein has. So generally speaking, including decoys is, is useful for that. Um, bioinformaticists will dis disagree on this point, but I always feel that having those in there lets me know what kind of the, the random bounces in my data look like. So I like to have that. Now, I, I'm going to pause for just a moment at label-free quant. Um, many, many people, especially here in Cape Town, make use of max quant software. Um, if, you're at, uh, if you have any interactions with the Blackburn team, for example, it's quite likely that you would assume you would analyze your data set with max quant. And one of the, the cool things that max quant offers is the ability to integrate chromatograms for peptide ions. Now before, what I've been showing you has been a bunch of count data, right? Spectral count tables that say how many spectra from this experiment were identified to a particular protein. That is a very legitimate way to find differences between cohorts, like our red versus yellow demo. But frequently, you'd like to get a bit more information out than just, is this protein differential and what direction? You might like to say, is this protein uh, at a 30% higher concentration or a 30% lower concentration? Is it 50% up or 50% down? If you get to that kind of precision, frequently people like to move away from spectral counts and instead use chromatogram uh, integration. So MaxQuant is very heavily invested in the idea of, of measuring protein change on the basis of integrated chromatograms. You can do the same thing here in FragPipe. I am not, however, going to check it. And the reason for this is that it takes a bit more time to sniff through these raw files and reconstruct chromatograms for each peptide. So you can use this and get uh, very valuable information out of it. In this case, we're, we're going to leave it aside and stick with spectral counts um, in this context. Okay, so we've, uh, we've got create report checked, multi-experiment, and print decoys. Let us move on to the run menu. Um, I need to tell it where to store this result. In the last run, we created a directory called result search only. This time, I'm going to create a new directory, and I'm going to call this one result uh, all philosopher. All philosopher. I just want to point out that it takes a lot of discipline in bioinformatics to name all of your tools over time in a consistent <coughs> way. I tend to bounce around from time to time and from year to year, I'll name a tool this way or that way. Alexei Nesvishki is, is epic in that he started out with a tool called Peptide Profit and today is creating a tool called Philosopher. When I worked with him, we created a tool named after um, uh, lamas, uh, the, the Buddhist figures. He has a, a, strong, a, a strong game over time in branding his software to be named after religious figures, including tools like Saint. <laughs> so. He's a really clever guy. I like him a lot. All right, so uh, we, we've named our directory result all philosopher. All right, and now I'm going to select that directory as our output. Once again, I want to print commands to show me just what I'm in for. Now, before, we had a relatively short list of things that we were going to do. We just needed to launch a total of 11 commands, but look at all this stuff. We have 128 commands to execute here. We're going to create workspaces. You see it's going to clean them and then initialize, uh, initialize new workspaces for each of the, the different raw files. 
It's going to launch MS Fragger on each of those input files. And then we have things like report database annotate. Down here we have peptide profit. Now you've already seen something like peptide profit running. You remember when we looked at ID Picker and we slurped up all of those pepxml files, it took a moment to sniff each one and we saw this green bar go rocketing across for each one. That was its process of interpreting the results of, the, of that peptide profit run. In this case, peptide profit is going to uh, do something rather more complex in order to assess the quality of each PSM. The target decoy method that ID Picker uses is all about aggregate error. In other words, we have this collection of PSMs and we want to assess the overall false discovery rate. But ID Picker is not going to tell you which PSMs are doubtful and which ones are great. It's just not going to do it. Peptide Profit, on the other hand, is going to put a probability of correctness on each and every PSM. That's an astonishing amount of work. It's going to use a technique called expectation maximization to do that. Uh, we see that there's a little bit more peptide profiting down here. And then we get into the deletion of a bunch of temporary files. That's not going to take time. But we do have interprofit and protein profit to run. Protein profit is the software that infers a set of proteins that explain all of the peptides that have been identified. We, uh, we use different approaches in ID Picker as, as are used uh, from, from those that are used in protein profit. Both of them are legitimate, and both of them seek to create what's called a parsimonious list of proteins. Parsimony means we want to use the smallest number of proteins possible to account for all of the peptides we observe. In ID Picker, we use something called a bipartite graph. Here they're using, again, an expectation maximization system that asks, uh, basically, how do I associate each peptide with multiple possible proteins that could explain it if you're dealing with something like a mammalian proteome? It's not a big problem when we get into the fine world of E. coli proteomics. Then we have report filtering. You can see it's going to apply razor peptide methods and a 1% protein probability um, of error. Uh, in order to do filtering, and finally uh, reporting out through some software called Report Abacus. Report Abacus is going to uh, work from this top-down uh, appraisal of all the proteins that have been seen to say how many spectra were identified to each protein in this raw file. Okay, so uh, we, we see it, it's quite a lot of stuff to do, and it is an uh, sadly going to take a little bit longer. So I'm going to go ahead and click run. I probably should have done that before explaining all that, but uh, we will click run and go ahead and start this off. So why would, it, it, if we, we have lots of information about peptides, right? We have the tandem mass spectrum that's been collected in these experiments, and we have multiple MS scans in which that peptide is observed in an in MS scan, right? So you might imagine, then, that we would, of course, want to make use of the intensity of peptides in the MS scans, rather than just saying there's a count or there's not a count. So are there, are there clear disadvantages? Are there obvious disadvantages to using intensity instead of the simple count business? Isn't it just really quick to be that's, that's actually a really interesting question. Um, relative to each other. So is it possible to compare the intensity for a peptide for, uh, to the intensity for a different peptide? So there are some real problems on this one. Uh, let's imagine that we have peptide A, and it has a completely different peptide sequence than does peptide B. Furthermore, peptide A and B appear at different retention times in LCMSMS. That's likely, right? In that scenario, is it reasonable to compare the intensity for peptide A to the intensity for peptide B? I want to point out that we don't have a single intensity. We have multiple intensities. So when you see a peptide come off a column, the first moment at which it is identified is uh, the moment when you have a tandem mass spectrum for it that succeeds in identification. And that may come very early in its solution or it may come relatively late in its solution. 
So we have to be careful that we consider all of these different snapshots of its intensity for each moment at which it was observed in the MS scan. So um, how do you, just as a, a broad question, if you have, let us say, 10 consecutive MS um, events at which you've observed a, frag, uh, a, a particular peptide, rather, how would you turn that into a single number representing its quantity? Have, has anyone heard of the, the trapezoid method? OK, let's take a really simple example. We've got three data points. We have a, a, a time point one where it was observed at 10 intensity, time point two at which it was seen at 100 intensity, time point three at which it was seen at 10. And we have some retention time associated with each of those three time points. If you think about it, for a, a given pair of, M over, uh, of retention times, you have two trapezoids formed, uh, sorry, one trapezoid formed. One base is the uh, intensity at retention time one, and another base is the retention time, uh, the intensity at retention time two. So the trapezoid method lets you compute what is the, what's the, the integration of that. Uh, so if you have multiple time slices, you can simply compute the area of each trapezoid and add that all together. All pretty straightforward. However, generally speaking, people who are trying to integrate chromatograms try to, to do so in a way that reflects that they match some ideal shape. That ideal shape is usually thought to be kind of a lagging, a lagging Gaussian, right? So everyone remembers what a Gaussian distribution looks like, a, a bell curve? Right, so uh, they, they, you, can, you can treat a, uh, an, an integrated, uh, the, the integration of a peptide as being matching a Gaussian to these observed intensities and try to fit one to the other. And then you say, what is the area, say, between the, uh, uh, in the middle 90% of this, of this bell curve? You can do something like that. My point, I hope, I hope that I'm navigating back around to this point successfully, is that there are a lot of, there's a lot of engineering that goes into the process of turning multiple measurements of intensity for a peptide at different retention times into an intensity. You may have some, some oddities show up, like how do you decide where this peak starts and where it stops? Even that is kind of a difficult question to answer. The next one comes when you have a peptide that you identify successfully in this raw file, but you didn't identify it successfully in another raw file. Now we have, uh, now we have quite the challenge that we have a, um, a peptide that was observed in one raw file and we need to say how much of it was observed in this other raw file. For something like this, MaxQuant has got a, a, a really interesting software um, way to address the problem but it's actually a really difficult thing to implement in a, in a robust way, which is to say we need to deal with the fact that there's retention time alignment issues among multiple experiments. If your, if your uh, retention time uh, uh, in, in a second run is 10% uh, slower than the first, column, uh, first time you run in a column, then the peptides may be shifting in, at the, in the retention times when they appear. So if you're going to compare an intensity that you got from the chromatogram in raw file one, you need to do this retention time alignment thing to make sure you're looking at the correct retention time in another raw file. People don't think about how hard this is, right? And it's amazing <laughs> that, the, the, that the software engineering in, in MaxQuant and in tools like Skyline and now here in FragPipe is able to, to deal with it. But we have to remember that all of that technical complication makes it quite a lot harder for us to interpret the results that come back. What happens if you go looking in a raw file for a particular peptide that you saw in another one and it doesn't exist in the second raw file? You end up integrating noise, basically, which creates some amount of background intensity even though there was zero of the peptide there. How do we discern what noise level is an appropriate one for saying this is a legitimate quantitation or this is not? So, most frequently, I would argue that if you want to do a if you want a quantitative result in proteomics, do a quantitative 
experiment. Running things in a shotgun style is not quantitative in that way. You can get quantitative information out, but there are serious limits to it. We have uh, workflows like selected reaction monitoring or uh, SWATH that are, uh, or, or other data independent acquisition methods that are very good at quantifying peptides and giving us a lot more information to, to ask how much change is observed. With a shotgun experiment, like the ones that we typically do um, with the, the DDA methods on the Q-Xactive, there are real limits to what we can say beyond this differs in an upward direction um, on, between these two cohorts. So I, I hope that uh, that's, that's useful, and I, I realize that there's, I'm, I'm really going on quite a lot about how we do this. But I would point out that if you have a whole bunch of experiments that you've run, maybe 200 samples, do you have any reasonable expectation that the retention times and ionization are, the, are exactly the same in run 200 as they were in run number one? You do not. If half of your samples are run this week and then everyone goes home for the weekend and next week it's warmer in the lab, do you have any reasonable expectation that in week two the data are comparable to those from week one? At the bare minimum, you'd better be ready for what's called a batch effect. So in general, simple measures like spectral counts are a whole lot less invariant in response to instrument variation and column variation than are measurements like intensity and chromatographic integration. Okay, so that's a very, very long discourse about why I like spectral counts. To say I like spectral counts is a is a um, is, is a pretty weak need way to go. I would say, I I like using spectral counts because frankly it's harder to mess up. It's a lot harder to mess up. So if if your question can be answered by yes this is different and in this direction spectral counts will get you there. If your question is how much you probably have to go with the the um, integration route. And if your result is all about a particular peptide, is this phosphopeptide changing in concentration between these experiments? You've really got no choice. At that point, you have to integrate peptides intensities because saying, yes, we observed it, or no, we didn't, is not much information. And spectral counting is not very useful at all for peptides individually. OK, so I've, uh, I've, I've now talked quite a lot. Um, I want to point out that in, uh, in the background, we can see that the software is evaluating these PSMs that it's digging out of the PEPXML file. The, uh, you'll, you'll see that we're getting some warnings back that say, mixture model quality test failed for charge uh, 4, 5, and 6, or 5, 6, and 7, whatever it is, uh, 5, 6, and 7 on the screen. I want to try to explain what that means. I mean, seeing a warning message can be really disorienting to people who don't know what the software is doing under, under the hood. So I want to point out that the software is attempting to put probabilities of correctness on individual PSMs. This PSM has a 96% chance of being right. This spectrum that's been matched to a peptide has a 99% chance of, of correctness. This one, on the other hand, is way sketched. It's got 80% chance of being correct. Um, obviously, you want to put more reliance on spectra that have uh, been identified very, very confidently and much less on peptides that have a much higher chance of error. So peptide profit is trying to compute that probability, but its expectation maximization method has got to be able to fit models to the spectra that it has to work with. And what kinds of spectra do we identify most successfully? Uh, what, what precursor charge states can we work with most successfully in protein identification? Does anyone know? Our bread and butter is plus twos and plus threes. A doubly charged peptide, when it breaks, tends to produce a single plus one fragment uh, for, the y, uh, for the Y ion and a single uh, plus one fragment for the B ion. Which means that if you have um, 18 peptide, or if you have 20 peptide bonds that are breaking if in a, a, say, a 21-22 amino acid uh, uh, poly, uh, poly, uh, polypeptide, that each of those breakpoints is going to leave two lines of evidence, a B ion and a Y ion. We like that. We can identify plus twos really, really well. And 
the fraction of plus two spectra that we identify successfully is a lot higher than for almost any other charge class. Plus three, we can also do pretty well. Our models for predicting which ions are observed from a plus three are a little weak in the knees, frankly. We, uh, and and it, the reason why is uh, built around this thing called charge segregation. When a plus three breaks, one side is probably going to take two protons and the other side's gonna take one. So we end up predicting twice as many fragment ions for a plus three as we would for the corresponding plus two. But twos and threes we can deal with pretty well. We generally do rather weakly when it comes to identifying spectra from quadruply charged peptide ions. You can do it, but keep in mind that you probably have plus one, plus two, and plus three fragments all resulting from the same peptide ion. That's kind of a mess. Identifying plus ones is difficult because they tend to be rather short. They don't generate a large number of fragment ions. So, Generally speaking, the software of, of instruments is designed around this assumption that you'd really rather get plus twos and plus threes than the, any other charge state. And so we have a fair number of identifications produced from them, and we have a better ability to decide whether we correctly <coughs> identified them or not. Okay, so we now see that interprofit is running. Um, the software is, is getting to the stage where it's a, trying to do a protein inference to say which proteins have been observed based on the peptides that have made it through our uh, peptide profit filtering. So this, this process, um, again, in E. coli is a really easy thing to deal with because in most cases, a peptide observed in E. coli can be explained by only one protein. Once you get to something like a human database, though, things get a lot harder. Now, if you're doing a search against Uniprot, which is a, a massive database of lots and lots of species, you're gonna to have to deal with the problem of orthology. If you're doing a search in a human database, things are gonna be a lot simpler because you're, you won't have this problem of multiple species sharing the same peptide. But you will still have problems with paralogy and with isoforms. So over the course of human evolution, we have many genes that have made many duplicates of themselves. And that paralogy uh, means that we have different genes in our genomes that share large amounts of sequence with another gene in there. Which means that if you identify a peptide from this shared region of these gene duplicates, the database is not going to give you any guidance on which of those two genes is the better explanation. The sequence is identical between the two. And if you're working in plants, yeah, you're doomed. You're just doomed because plants, they do gene duplication like nobody's business, right? So that's, that's a really big problem. Um, then the other problem is one of isoforms. So we know that individual genes may produce multiple transcripts because of exon shuffling. Typically, in proteomic databases, uh, the, the sequence databases, we see that the different isoforms are listed as separate proteins, which means that if you identify a peptide from a region that's common to a set of gene duplicates, uh, sorry, a, a set of uh, transcript uh, set of transcripts, um, that peptide could belong to this transcript, or it could belong to that transcript, or it could belong to the other, it could belong to all of them. We have this problem then that we need to, to use parsimony in trying to make sense of the data. We need to say what is the smallest number of proteins we can possibly invoke to explain all the peptides we've observed. Peptide Profit is doing that work for us, and you can tell that in this, in this context, it's, it's taking some time to do. I believe that our uh, demonstration of how long it took to run MS Fragger itself lasted approximately five minutes, right? It wasn't much longer than that. Here we're sitting down for about 20 minutes to see the whole thing take place. At the end of this, are you going to get more information or less than what ID Picker would give you from reading the same PEPEX smells? We are going to get more information, yeah. Um, as, as, as I noted, the software, uh, the, the Peptide Profit software is going to be able to tell us the probability of correctness for each peptide, and it's going to put a probability of correctness on individual proteins. Now, that might seem like it's a rather academic difference, but I want you to think of yourself as a professor right now. You're a professor. You're a professor. I grant thee, professor. You are a professor. Right? 
you have a, an eager grad student working with you. And you're now faced with this decision, will I or won't I pursue this proteomics finding and put them on this project for the next two years to chase down this protein? How would you make such a decision? Would you feel more or less confident if you had a protein that had a 99% probability of detection or one with an 80% probability of detection? 99. If you, if you really need to know, is this protein certainly present, having a, a probability of detection that you can trust is really, really important. And that's something that you can achieve using this interprofit uh, approach. So we, we see that after our, our diligence and patience and a whole lot of talking from me, I'm sorry about that, our, our software workflow has finished. And now we can take a look at the result. Um, so I created a directory called All Philosopher to reflect that. Uh, now we see that red one is still here. Now look at this. Before, we just had a pepxml uh, file in there. In this case, we have a pepxml and a bunch of TSVs and other stuff. So um, why don't we try walking through some of this? Now, I always like the fact that they uh, create HTML reports for us because that can uh, give us something really valuable to look at without a whole lot of specialized software. So for red one, we are going to look at the delta mass HTML document. What are we looking at? Does anyone have an intuitive sense of what delta mass means in the context of a, of a PSM identification process? Change in mass, yes. Specifically, this is the difference between the mass observed from the peptide ion and the mass observed on the peptide sequence. All right, but we see that these mass bins are, um, they're, they're showing us a lot of mass bins that aren't really going to apply to this context. So can we look at a narrow region? Oh, look at that, it's interactive, that's so cool. All right, we've been allowed to zoom in. Uh, so I'm going to zoom in on this blue part because it's the part that we actually care about. How much mass error is allowable? Um, how is allowable for a PSM identification process in closed search or narrow search? We allowed up to 50 ppm, I believe. Right? So here we're able to see um, the, the mass bins that were produced in, in this particular case. Now, this is not really showing us the typical mass error because this is breaking it down to 0.1 size bins. Um, in, in some of the older visualizations, you could actually see the distribution of um, the known decoy hits, which is usually kind of uniform across that 50 ppm window. And a sharp spike in the middle for correct target uh, hits. Okay, so this you can think of this report as essentially being useful now, uh, not for uh, the kind of closed search we did, but for open search, where you're trying to evaluate um, which mass shifts corresponding to post-translational modifications were most important. Remember that we have a bunch of TSV files. These TSVs are tab-separated values again. Um, I'm going to open them in a text editor for just a moment. This is a PSM table. Uh, and we see that it's got an awful lot of columns. I don't really want to view it this way after all. I'm going to pop open Excel. Hi, Excel. I'm going to open up a blank workbook. Close that because we don't actually want the blank workbook. We just wanted to get past that interface. And now we're going to drag PSM's TSV over here. We see that we have a whole bunch of spectrum identifiers at the left. You see that? So each of the spectra that was called identified has been given a different row in this table. We have peptide sequences, we have charge states, retention times and seconds. We have calculated mass-to-charge values and observed mass-to-charge values and the, the delta masses that are associated with that, the change between what we saw and what we expected on the basis of this peptide sequence. This is a lot of information. Is it always going to be necessary to you? No. And I would further point out that we haven't even left the, the directory of red one. These are all information that pertain to just this one directory. So let's instead look at some of these broader effects. We see that we have combined files. These reflect 
not just a single pepxml file for just red one or just red two, but rather a combination across those. And we have pepxmls, which represent the PSMs, but we also have a protein XML that reflects the protein inference made from it. We still have our Fragger params file, which is awfully useful if we're trying to reproduce this search. Um, for example, on the server, if I drag this over to my uh, text file viewer, you can see that all of the different uh, uh, parameters that are available to you uh, within the MS Fragger are, con are configured within this text file. So it's handy for it to preserve that for us because someday we want to publish this stuff. And they're going to, you're going to need to know those parameters to do so. We have the frag pipe config itself. This is how the user interface um, uh, observed um, what we specified. You might want to go back to look at all of that text that was scrolling by as you ran your search. That's here in the log file. Very handy. But these little values down here, I think, are the ones that are going to be our all-stars. So I'm going to reopen Excel and now copy this, this reprint in intensities TSV file. Okay, we are now looking at one row for each protein group that we identified here. You can see it just goes on and on and on for hundreds of proteins. What was the total number that it's claimed were uh, observed here? 830 different discernible proteins. I don't think you guys might remember the ID picker result earlier, but ID picker is generally less sensitive than the peptide profit um, um, uh, algorithm that's been used here. Um, so in general, if you analyze the same search results with Philosopher or with ID picker, you can probably uh, uh, see a, a maybe as much as a 10% difference in the number of overall proteins that you identify. But I, I, want, I would also point out that uh, since each column represents a particular run, you would kind of like to see a whole bunch of values in here. But it's all zeros. So I would note that we told the software we did not want to do the label-free quantitation by chromatogram integration. We, did not we didn't check that box. So the intensities it reports are zero. OK, so that's not so very helpful. We could go back and do that step if we want to uh, spend a little more time um, sitting here, um, and I'm, I'm happy to walk people through that if, ne if need be. But let's uh, open up the SPC table. Fre frequently you will see SPC used in proteomics to represent a spectral count table. So this is the same kind of table that we uh, saw in the pivot table produced in ID Picker earlier, except now we're probably doing so with a slightly higher um, uh, sensitivity of identification. We'll note that the descriptions uh, didn't make it in here. The, the description information is not passed through to this. So it may be a little harder to figure out what the functions of those um, different accessions are. But if you've got a web browser open to Uniprot, you're going to be able to look them up just fine. Um, you will also note that it's not giving you a statistic out to say what is the rate ratio uh, uh, between the red and yellow cohorts. It has nothing to say that these two cohorts uh, really exist. It just knows that this one's called red 1, and this one's called red 3, and that one's red uh, 5, that one's you know, yellow 4, and so on. It hasn't done the work for you of computing a metric that says this is um, a protein that's differential. There are, however, many R packages produced now uh, that are happy to take these tables in and provide an answer for you about their differences. So you can see that we had to wait a little longer. But on the other hand, we didn't have to install any other software. We'd already installed Philosopher and, and MS Fragger and, and FragPipe to create this interface. So you already have these tools in hand if you've copied these files from the thumb drives. So that's pretty handy. And we can see that a lot of information comes back out as a result. <coughs> so I, uh, as I said, the, the capabilities of Philosopher are changing very, very rapidly. I was uh, writing a paper with an earlier version of Philosopher back in April, and I was astonished to see how much had changed in just a short time since April uh, on this code base. In general, you know that you're working at a great school because it has construction cranes everywhere as people build new buildings and new labs and so on. In the same way, you know you're using great bioinformatics code if you see great programmers making lots and lots of, of changes along the way to make it even better. So I, I really feel that um, we have something really great in Philosopher and MS Fragger and, uh, yeah, and in FragPipe. 
having the ability to launch that much power um, from one combined graphical user interface takes a lot of muscle power. And I'm really grateful to the, the team for, um, for all the work they've been doing and answering my questions along the way. Um, you know, as I ran into weird buglets and things, as I was putting this demo together, the, the team up at, at the University of Michigan was writing back with their answers just as fast as I could send them out. So I, I really appreciate them for that. In any case, that is today's presentation on how to use this software. You now have it installed. If you need copies of these, uh, of these files, I can email you uh, 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 links to things. It's not necessary to have all four gigabytes just to get the software. The great bulk of the volume that I gave you uh, on those thumb drives was actually the raw files. If you subtract those out, this gets a lot easier to pass around. But of course, if you're going to use MS Fragger uh, on an ongoing basis, it's very much appropriate that you set up a license agreement with the University of Michigan to do so. They will ask you for your email address. You will wait overnight, and then you'll get an email saying, here's your, your code, you're licensed. So it's, it's, not a, it's not an onerous situation at all. And it helps them for Alexi's group to be able to say, 50 people downloaded our software in one day is helpful to them. They can say to the NIH, look, we really need you to support the continued development of this software. Software development is not cheap. You do not know how hard it is to find a really talented programmer, recruit them to your group, keep them happy for a long time, and productive. Programmers are very, very much in demand, and people who develop skills doing stuff like this, they get hired away really quickly. So we want to make sure that groups like Alexis can keep uh, very talented people employed. All right, with that said, I am very pleased to hand out your certificates of attendance for today's course. Um, if you're listening on YouTube, thank you so much for, uh, for being part of this, and uh, I will look forward to any questions. Thank you.